again to those here and those who are watching online. We're glad to have you here this morning. Our call to worship is, comes from Amos 3, 7. Surely, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. At this time, the praise team will come up. It is time for our morning prayer. For those who can, please kneel as far as possible. Good morning, dear Lord. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us this week. Some days are easier, some days are harder, but Father, you're always there with us, holding our hand and getting us through the day. Father, we ask your blessing upon the message that Dale's bringing us today. Father, touch him and help us to open our hearts and minds to what is to be said. Father, we encourage that you watch over the Sylvia family as they're traveling, although we're grateful to have Nathaniel here. Father, I just ask that you bless each one who's here. Continue to guide and direct in our lives, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning, again, is in Amos 3.7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Verla will have a story for us. These stories that I've been telling are about uh, Ellen Harmon White, and this book was written by her granddaughter, great-granddaughter, sorry. And uh, she wrote stories that the family knew and probably none of us would have heard about. She's still at home with her family, one night an angel appeared to Ellen and the angel said, Ellen, God wants you to do a special work for him. He wants you to be his messenger. The angel said, it won't be easy to be God's messenger. Some people will make fun of you some will try to harm you. God wants you to write down whatever he tells you to. Tell the people what he tells you to. Travel wherever he wants you to go. And don't be afraid. God's everlasting love will go with you, the angel said. If you're ever in danger, the angel said, pray to God, and he will send you another angel. And that was the title of this book, Ellen, the girl with two angels, because we each one have a guardian angel. But the, this angel told Ellen that if she was in danger to pray and God would send a second angel. We know angels are very strong. Just one angel seems very strong compared to what we know. Well, angel, Ellen thought about what the angel had said. She had been so afraid to tell a small group of Adventists that came to her folks' home to study and pray, how could she go out and travel and do all of that for God? 
She didn't think she could, but this time she didn't try to run away. She just knelt down to pray and said, Dear Lord, I don't have the strength to be your messenger. She said, my hand shakes so bad, I can't even hold a pen. How can I write? I might get proud and sin sinful. I don't want that. Oh, dear God, please, please have somebody else be your me messenger. All Ellen heard in her mind was, make known to others what I have shown you. She went to her dad and started to cry, and he said, what's the matter, Ellen? And she said, I want to obey God, but how can I? And he said, Ellen, my child, if God asks you to talk, he'll give you a voice. If he asks you to travel, he'll make you strong enough. If he asks you to write, he'll guide your trembling hand. Don't be afraid, Ellen. You must trust Jesus. He'll never ask you to do anything that's impossible. A few days later, this group of Adventists came to the Harmon home and the father thought, well, I'll tell this group about Ellen and how she feels. And so one of the group says, let's pray for Ellen. So they all knelt down and prayed Ellen said in her mind, Dear Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And it seemed to her like angels surrounded her. All the people that were kneeling didn't see anything happen. But there was one man that didn't kneel because he had a sore knee and he saw a ball of fire come down from heaven and go to Ellen's heart. He said, I'll believe anything Ellen says now. God is with her. That very same week, Ellen's brother-in-law, Sam, who was married to Mary, her sister, came to visit. It was the middle of winter, and they had snow and cold weather there, too. And um, Sam said to Ellen, Mary would like to have you come and visit us, but I know you'll have to wait till the weather gets better. And Ellen said, no, I'll go, because she remembered God wanted her to go. And he said there were groups of Adventists where they lived that were so discouraged because, you know, it was disappointing to everyone that Jesus hadn't come and taken them to heaven. And Sam said, well, Ellen, I've only got an open sleigh for you to ride in, and it's 30 miles to our place. And of course, the sleigh would be pulled by a horse, so the 30 miles would take quite a little while. Well, Ellen decided she would go anyway. Plans were made. Mother fixed the lunch, and then they heated some bricks because the bricks would stay warm, and they fixed a place with blankets and bricks so that Ellen would keep warm as they went to her sister's place. 
a few um, nights after she got there, they met with a group of Adventists, and she, Ellen stood up and was going to tell them about the visions that God had given her. When she started to talk, she didn't have a voice. All she could do was whisper. So she didn't sit down, no, she just kept on whispering as loud as she could. And pretty soon, her voice came out nice and strong. And she talked to the people and told them about the vision of the Adventists going to heaven. And then she told them about the other vision she'd had about Jesus still leading them even after he didn't come when they thought he would. Ellen talked for two hours to them and her voice stayed nice and strong. They had questions afterwards and she answered all the questions. <coughs> then when Ellen sat down, her voice was gone again. She knew that she had done what God wanted her to do, and she was happy that God had used her as his messenger to bring hope to these people on earth. Ellen, later in life, wrote many books, and we're encouraged by those two. Each one of us can read those. Thank you, Verla. The um, topic today is entitled Faithful to His Prophets. The, um, do you all get the monthly journal from the, the conference, uh, Adventist Journey? It's sent to everyone, and in it has a week of prayer, and we, we don't do those often, and so I thought that we should take a look at the week of prayer, and for those that don't have it or didn't bring it, that's partly why I put it in the bulletin. Clifford, would you pass out that? I have copied here today, Sabbath, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, four days, and we're going to read those uh, today, and you can follow along. If you need one, just let Clifford know. Um, next Sabbath, we'll do the last four, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sabbath. <clears throat> it's, it's about the prophets, and I appreciate Verla's stories, because <clears throat> God has spent the entire history of this earth trying to communicate with us, his people. And um, he's done it through prophets, and... The, the most recent prophet is Mrs. White, and she has written extensively. And when you read stories of her life and the biographies and listen to Verla tell the stories, I remember <clears throat> Verla's been telling these stories all of my life. And uh, uh, they're always fresh and new. And when they are all verifiable stories as well, when you look at the history records, it's clear that she certainly is a spokesperson for God, and like all spokespersons, most of them, most true prophets do not want to speak for God. It's hazardous. Um, and they usually ask not to do that. So if you have somebody that's wanting to come and uh, be a prophet, uh, for instance, the, the, if you'll notice on there, the, the authors, uh, Sabbath is written by uh, our conf general conference president, uh, Ted Wilson. The others are written by the uh, Blancos, and they had the publishing work in South America. And uh, maybe it's in one of the stories, but uh, they did mention that in the publishing work, they have frequent requests of people writing to them that they've got a message from God and it needs to be published. It's got to be published now. And they think and pray over it and look at it and uh, they usually turn all of those down because seldom do you see God's prophets going out insisting that, that the message be given. They're always very reluctant. 
And perhaps, you know, some, maybe that's a little bit why we as Adventists are reluctant to share our faith. Uh, because sometimes it's not always uh, well received. And we don't like it when we're not well received. So just multiply that many times for the prophet. Now, I appreciate uh, Nancy's prayer that uh, God would bless me as we work on this sermon. And he certainly has. Because Sabbath is going to be read by Carl. Uh, Sundays is going to be read by Nathaniel. Mondays is going to be read by Ariana. Ariana Rittenhouse drove all the way down today. Uh, Fox Valley? Sheboygan. Sheboygan. I mean, that's, that's way up, you know, almost to the Arctic Circle. <laughs> But she didn't come down just to read this. You want to know why she came? She came to watch John at Mamma Mia tonight. The play, he's in the play, a star role. And so and they say it's worth going, just so you know. But thank you, Ariana, for being willing to be a God's messenger. And Lasong will read uh, Tuesdays. So indeed, God has already blessed. So uh, before we begin our readings, let us just bow our heads for prayer. Father, sometimes as we read, we get terribly bored and tired. Pray that your spirit would activate our hearts and our minds and our ears, perhaps even our voices, that as we listen to the message of these week of prayer readings, that we might have a greater understanding of your awesome love in that you go to great extents to get our attention and to communicate with us May we be attentive to your, your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Imagine the first face you ever saw was the face of God. Imagine that the first voice you ever heard was God's voice. That's how it was with Adam and Eve and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, Genesis 2.7. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man, verse 22. When Adam and Eve opened their eyes, they looked into the lovely face of Jesus, and the first words they heard came from his melodious voice. Everything was perfect in their beautiful garden home. They enjoyed the company of angels, of each other, of God himself. Ellen White describes the scene. The holy pair were not only children under the fatherly care of God, but students receiving instructions from the all-wise creator. They were visited by angels and were granted communion with their maker with no obscuring veil between. But once sin entered this world, things went horribly wrong. Instead of delighting to meet with God, our first parents fled in terror, seeking to hide. But of course, no one can hide from God. Of the many things they lost that day, one of the most painful was the privilege of open face-to-face -face communion with God himself. Adam, in his innocence, had enjoyed open communion with his maker, but sin brought separation between God and man, and the atonement of Christ alone could span the abyss and make possible the communication of blessing or salvation from heaven to earth. When we love someone, we want to talk with them and spend time together. Those of us who are parents long to spend time with our children, sharing experiences, teaching and encouraging them, and offering help when needed. We want to give them the gift of being there and communicating together. If we human beings have such a longing to communicate with those whom we love, how much more 
does our Father in heaven long to communicate with us. Jesus said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Matthew 7, 11. God did not abandon his people, leaving them to the devil's devising. Since God could no longer speak face to face with fallen humanity because of the sin barrier, nor teach them as he had previously, he created other ways to communicate his all-important life-saving instruction to the world. The Bible identifies at least nine avenues that God has used to communicate with people. One, angels. Two, creation or nature. Three, the cloud and pillar of fire. Four, Urim and Thummim. Five, dreams. Six, voice from heaven. Seven, the Holy Spirit guiding individuals. Eight, Christ in person. And nine, prophets. While God has used all these communication methods, the major revelations of the will of God for the instruction of the church in all ages has been given through prophets, with Jesus being chief among them. Luke 24, 19, Matthew 13, 57, and 58. God's prophets are so important that the Bible assures us, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets, Amos 3, 7. Why did God send prophets? We find the answer in the Bible. Because he had compassion on his people, 2 Chronicles 36, 15. The context of this passage is interesting. The kingdom of Judah had lost much and was on the brink of Babylonian captivity and destruction. Following a series of wicked kings, Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, and all the leaders of the priest and the people transgressed more and more according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Verse 14. This happened in spite of God sending numerous prophets, including Jeremiah, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. Verse 12. These prophetic messengers were sent because the Lord had compassion on his people. Verse 15. How did God's people respond? They mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Verse 16. It's a serious thing to despise the messages God sends through his prophets. In this case, it resulted in the death of young men and women, elderly individuals, even those who sought refuge in God's sanctuary. The remaining treasures of the sanctuary were plundered and God's house was burned. Jerusalem's walls were broken down and the city destroyed. Those who lived were taken to Babylon as captives. All of this the Lord had warned them about through his prophets, including Jeremiah. But the people refused to listen. Verse 15. Sadly, God's prophets and the messages he sends through them have often been rejected. Nevertheless, God has persisted in maintaining a prophetic channel of communication to his people the apple of his eye, 
Deuteronomy 32.10, Zacharias 2.8. Through the ages, God has given vital, life-saving messages through his prophets. Prophets are ordinary people whom God has chosen to represent him by receiving his divine messages and delivering them faithfully to his people. God spoke to his prophets in visions and dreams, and the prophets, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, conveyed what they saw and heard using their own language, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1.21 Prophets have played a vital role throughout human history, illustrating why God has blessed his people by sending prophets. In his book, Messenger of the Lord, Herbert Douglas gives eight reasons God used prophets rather than some dramatic attention-getting device such as writing on the clouds or thundering out his will every morning at dawn. One. Prophets pointed to and prepared the way for Christ's first advent. Two, as representatives of the Lord, prophets showed people that God valued human beings enough to choose from among them men and women to represent him. Three, prophets were a continual reminder of the nearness and availability of God's instruction. Four, the presence of prophets tested the people about their attitude toward God. Five, messages through the prophets accomplished the same purposes as personal communication from the Creator. Six, prophets demonstrate what fellowship with God and the transforming grace of the Holy Spirit can accomplish in human lives. Seven, prophets help to communicate the plan of salvation, for God has consistency, consistently used a combination of the human and the divine as his most effective means for reaching lost humanity. And eight, the prophet's outstanding work is their contribution to the written word. Clearly, prophets serve as a key communication link between God and human beings. Many of God's messages of instruction, explanation, warning, reproof, encouragement, and ultimate plans are preserved for us through God's written word, the Bible. The Bible is a collection of God's messages for his people, a record of his working among them, written by his prophets over a span of nearly 1,600 years from Moses to the Apostle John, as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The gift of prophecy is one of the gifts of the Spirit listed in 1 Corinthians 12. And God's word indicates it will be present at the end of time. In identifying God's last day remnant people, we read, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12:17. Related to this passage, the concept of God speaking through his prophets, we read the words of the angel to John. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10 Seventh-day Adventists believe that God in his wisdom and compassion, has raised up a prophet for these last days. While it is not necessary to mention all the tests of a prophet here, one important test is that a true prophet will never 
contradict previous messages given through God's prophets. For the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. 1 Corinthians 14, 32. And if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8, 20. Throughout all of her writings, letters, sermons, and messages, Ellen White upholds the Bible and never contradicts its teachings. Millions have been led to Jesus through her prophetic ministry. Millions more have been blessed through the God-given counsel she provides. Insights into healthful living, education, ministry, and more continue to serve as guidepost for God's people today. Warnings of things to come and instructions on how best to prepare are messages that benefit all who take them seriously. During this week of prayer, I encourage you to consider the incredible gift of wisdom and compassion God has given us through his prophets and to remember the blessings that come from heeding his word. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Second Chronicles 20, 20. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Nathaniel, come. <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to the Amos 3, 7. And you notice that it's printed in the bulletin. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. The word secret. Does God have a bunch of secrets? Think about it. Imagine for a moment that you have never heard of Christianity. Suddenly you come across a book on the street, you pick it up, and it just says Holy Bible on the cover. Nothing about its author. Who wrote it? The first thing I do when I pick up a book, other than reading the title, is to look for its author. Having worked in the publishing field, I know exactly where to find the information on the copyright page. But surprise, when you look when you open the Holy Bible, the information about the Bible author is not there. What should the first time reader, the one who approaches the Bible for the first time, assume? Who wrote it? How did it come to us? Who put it together? Of course, even a lay person in religious matters knows that Christians claim the Bible has its origin in God himself. Does that mean the Bible as we know it today fell from heaven? Does God have secretaries or editors? Was it written by God or by human beings? A key decision we must make when approaching the phenomenon of the Bible is to determine whether we will analyze it from viewpoints that are alien to us or give priority to the way in which it defines itself. For us to gather its meaning, it would not be fair to the book and its author or authors to discard what the Bible says about itself and its origin. One of the most prof prolific writers in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, rightly noted all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof and creation, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belong to God, may be proficient, equipped for every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. In the same vein, the Apostle Peter states, we also have a message and something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about the prophet. Own interpretation about things for prophecy never had its origin in human. Will but prophets through human spoke from God 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter one nineteen and twenty one. The biblical, the biblical self witness affirms that the scriptures are inspired by God. The prophets spoke as they were being inspired by the Holy Spirit. These two Bible passages contain a wealth of in depth information about the origin and nature of the Bible. They state one, the scripture had its origin in God, and He is the one who takes the lead, revealing Himself and communicating with human beings. Two, the revelation occurs though the phenomenon of inspiration. And three, that the phenomenon applies to the entire Bible. When we consider these verses about the origin of the Bible, it is important to keep in mind both that are affirmed and what do not while emphasis is on God, being the author of the Bible, the passages do not assert that he is a writer, the writer, holy men of God, who those who recorded the revelation under divine inspiration. So the Apostle Peter clearly states that although human beings are the physical agents of the scripture, the origin of revelation, the source of the content, that is found in the scriptures is God himself. Human activities take part in this process, but it is not the source from which the explanations, expositions, or inter contain in a scripture emerge. The question remains, how should we understand the relationship between the divine author and human writers? What part does each of these actors play? How was the process of revelation embodied in the scriptures? Even a superficial approach to the Bible as a book is enough for readers to realize the writing of the Bible has not phenomenon that developed in a short time and in the same way throughout on the contrary, the Bible as it has come to us in the result about 40 writers who left the testimonies over the 15 centuries in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, are more scholarly approached, which show that the many literary styles correlate with the number of authors and the divisibility of cultures represented. So then how was the Bible put together? The verses we have briefly analyzed, 2 Timothy 3.16 to 2 Peter, 121 categorically state that God inspired the scriptures. This term, however, is too broad to articulate an explanation in how divine method to communicate the will of God in writing works in practice. Considering the statements of scripture itself, the Bible in its written form, scholars have tried to understand how the phenomenon of inspiration works Although, as Seventh-day Adventist, we reject the theory of mechanical or verbal inspiration, we do not believe that every word of Scripture was dictated by prophets. The Holy Spirit guides the prophets in the writing process, enduring, ensuring that the prophets' own words express authoritatively and reliably the message they receive. Therefore, words are to the process of revelation and inspiration. In fact, God guided the writers themselves who in turn expressed the divine revelations in their own words. The way biblical writers expressed themselves, the word chosen to convey the divine message were their own choice, guided by Holy Spirit. In other words, the writers of the Bible were the scribes of God, not his pens. The biblical writers used the imperfect vehicle of human language. The word of God is the supreme authoritative and revelation of God will. Thus, the imperfect human vehicle communicates the truth. However, in the same way that the divine human nature of God is invisible, 
also the content and the vehicle cannot be separated in the Bible. It is impossible to this human phenomenon. God generates information and guides the writer's process without nullifying any human or ability, but he makes sure that the result of the whole process is reliable and true to his purpose. Thank you, Nathaniel. Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret. You could replace that with his purpose to his servants, the prophets. His purpose is hidden until God reveals it because there's no man that has possibly an inkling of what's in the mind of God. Ariana, thank you for coming and reading. The God Proclaimed and Self-Proclaimed, <clears throat> Monday, by Marcos and Claudia Blanco. What are the marks of a true prophet? What do you think about when the woman who claims to be a prophet, whose messages are on YouTube, what do you think? Um, an apprehensive brother blurted out while I was greeting church members after the worship service one Sabbath morning. To be honest, I've never heard of her, I replied. Let me watch the videos first, and then I'll, make, then I'll be able to give you a more informed response. After watching the videos, I discerned that by all accounts, the woman was not a true prophet. YouTube has enabled greatly, has enabled, enabled greatly expanded visibility for self-proclaimed prophets. What drives a person to assert that they have received prophetic messages from God? More important, how can the church assess whether someone has actually received a prophetic message from God? And if they receive the message, messages, does it make them prophets immediately? On the other hand, we should keep in mind that God still wants to communicate with us through prophets. The Apostle Paul recommends, do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophets with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. We make a serious mistake if we disregard the true prophetic message, either, that, either the one that God has conveyed to us through the prophets of old, or the one that God wants to communicate to his prophets. Um, communicate to his people at the end of time. On the other hand, Christ warned about the rise of false prophets. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. They would also aim to deceive even the elect just before the second coming. That's why John's advice is very clear. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test of the prophets. What then are the marks of a true prophet of God? The Bible shows that the rising of false prophets, false prophets phenomenon is not unique to contemporary Christianity. It had already manifested itself among the people of Israel in the days of, Jerus of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's contemporary, contemporaries were instructed to use the filter of fulfilled prophecies as a test for a genuine prophet. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction um, comes true. Bear in mind that the ministry of a prophet encompasses much more than the foretelling of the future. That the principle of condition, conditional prophecies establishes that a change in the conditions or in the relationships can also imply um, a change in the predict predicted future, as happened with Jonah's prediction in the destruction of Nineveh. Another test eliminates concerns the internal coherence of the prophetic message. A system of revealed truths consists of a chain of re related messages. The same spirit revealed all the prophetic messages in the canon of scripture. Therefore, every new message must be in harmony with the truths previously revealed. Consult God's instruction in the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Christ himself appealed to all the scriptures concerning himself. From the past to, sh past to, shown, from the past to shown that his messages uh, um, as a prof prophet and his sacrifice as Messiah were truthful and prophecies were correctly fulfilled. Certainly, truth is progressive, 
new truth is revealed over time, and later prophets add ideas and details to the truths already revealed by earlier prophets, but in no way can the new message contradict the messages given in the past. While it is true that what co counts in the, is the message, not the messenger, the prophets are but human beings with all their weaknesses and limitations. Christ calls on us to see the fruit in the life of an aligned, alleged prophet. When judge, judging the authenticity, by their fruit you will, be you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Thus, by their fruit you will be recognized. You will recognize them. Although sometimes it takes time, a ravenous wolf will sooner or later show its fangs through its mild, cheap disguise. Of course, every prophet has to be Christ-centered and confess the divine nature of Christ and exalt his sacrifice for humanity. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not um, does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Other signs of true prophets might include the timely nature of their messages, the practical nature of their messages, as opposed to abstractions and generalizations, the truth in the lives of those who follow their messages, and receiving the re uh, revelations through dreams and visions. However, we will do well to remember that passing the acid test in any or a few of these signs does not make someone a true prophet. Just as the divine vision from King Nebuchadnezzar received did not make him a prophet in the whole dimension of his ministry. The price of being a true prophet. During the years that we have served in South America, Spanish publishing house, we have received more than a dozen manuscripts containing alleged prof prophetic messages from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Some were sent to us just to evaluate their content. Other came with the supposed divine order to publish them immediately. Being denied the possibility, a number of people condemned us to eternal damna damnation for not complying with their directive. We have found out that most of these alleged prophets have something in common, an almost desperate desire to be acknowledged as prophets. Yet when we examine the experience of the biblical prophets, we see that things are the, way, the other way around. Many of them resist accepting the call or are asked for countless proofs that they should accept the call. The main reason is that a, typically a prophet is unwelcome. The greatest of all prophets ended up with his head on a silver platter. These experiences have taught us to test the spirits, especially when the alleged prophets insist they be acknowledged as messengers of God. Every falsification implies the existence of something genuine. In fact, the more sophisticated the counterfeit, the more evidence is given of the value of the, of the authentic version that this counterfeit wants to supplant. That is why Satan tries to supplant true prophets. He is aware of the value of the true divine messages. Let's test the spirits, but let's not stifle the voice of the spirit. Thank you, Ariana. With, uh, even though it's the lateness of the hour, with your permission, I'm going to ask the song to read the, the fourth one, please. Uh, okay, this part is, I think, is very technical, so may the Holy Spirit help us to understand as, as he helps us to understand Scripture. Um, are we reading the Bible the right way? In Jesus, we find an exceptionally interesting phenomenon. In him, message and prophet merge. He was both the Father's greatest revelation and a great prophet, as recognized by his contemporaries. Sir, even the Samaritan woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Not only was Christ the revelation and revealer, message and messenger, but he was also a great interpreter of the scriptures. As a prophet, he conveyed direct messages from heaven. And in the traditional school of the prophet's way, he was a great exponent, or someone who promotes the truth and benefit, and interpreter of the Torah. Even at an early age, he left the teachers of the law speechless, 
so that everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. His authority as an exponent of the scriptures was recognized both by the people of Israel and the religious leaders of Jerusalem who addressed him with the title of teacher sent by God. Although Christ did not come to change the source of the revelation, the law, but to fulfill it, his mission was to bring the true meaning of the scriptures to a people who had strayed from both the method of correct interpretation and the true practice of genuine religion. Thus, Jesus constantly contrasted the methods of contemporary interpretation, alluding to what was said or what they understood concerning what had been said with the, but I tell you, of the true prophetic interpretation. And since Christ was not only a great teacher and prophet, but also our example in everything, we would do well to follow his principles of biblical interpretation in our own study. Did he outline his principles of biblical interpretation in any of his teachings or speeches? One episode shortly before his ascension to his heavenly father can help us draw out a number of those interpretive principles. Let's join Jesus on this path that leads us to discover the true meaning of the prophetic word. Let's walk along with him to Emmaus and let him guide us through some principles of biblical interpretation that will leave our minds enlightened and our hearts burning. The hermeneutics of Jesus, or the interpretation of scripture, or interpretation, Jesus' interpretation. In Luke 24, while addressing those two discouraged disciples who were returning to Emmaus, Jesus presented them practically and schematically with several principles of biblical interpretation that he had already given to his disciples and followers throughout his ministry. The account informs us that the two disciples were walking along feeling saddened by the recent death of Jesus because with his death, all their messianic expectations had vanished. Then Jesus joined them, although they did not recognize him. On hearing from their lips the reasons for their, their discouragement, he replied, how foolish are you? And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. From his answer, we can draw several principles of prophetic interpretation. Number one, the canonical principle. Christ did not interpret the truthfulness of his messianic mission in the light of the first century reality around him, nor through Jewish tradition or Greek philosophy, the predominant cultures at that time. On the contrary, he used what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That is, he used the scriptures to interpret biblical information, his own role as Messiah. Hence, the information needed to interpret the Bible is found in the canon of the scriptures themselves. The scriptures are their own interpreter. Christ himself had established the supremacy of the Bible over tradition, and other writers underscored the fact that the scriptures have preeminence over number one, human philosophy, number two, human reason, and number three, the so-called knowledge in the world of which science might even be, be considered a part. The basic scientific procedure requires that our hermeneutic, hermeneutical presuppositions or assumptions stem from what we intend to understand. The dependence on philosophy to establish theological hermeneutical presuppositions implies a breakdown with the canonical principle. Rather than following from philosophical, philosophical presuppositions, principles of interpretation must be derived from the scriptures themselves in order to interpret biblical information. Number two, the principle of the unity of the scriptures. In the first article of this series, we learned that the, although the Bible was written by many writers over a period of many centuries, all scripture is inspired by the same spirit and is altogether the word of God. In this sense, a crucial unity and harmony exists between its parts. Christ emphasized this principle before these two disciples on their way to Emmaus, when, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. By referring to Moses, the Pentateuch or the Torah, and all the prophets, Jesus used in his explanation the whole Bible known at that time, the Hebrew Bible emphasizing this principle of unity of the scriptures. Number three, the Christological principle. 
One reason Jesus used the whole Hebrew Bible to indicate what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself was that all scriptures testify about him. The New Testament endorsed this idea by describing Christ as the fulfillment and the consummation of the promises made to the patriarchs, since all the prophets testify about him. For all the promises of God in him are yes. Number four, the principle of the salvific purpose. The scriptures were not written just to satisfy intellectual curiosity, so we should not study them only to win a debate or to show that we have the right doctrine. By pointing out that he was the fulfillment of all the promises of the scriptures, Christ presented himself as the Lamb of God who is able to save. The revelation of his salvation is the overall purpose of scripture and is the foundational interpretive idea as we study. By using the right principles of prophetic interpretation, Jesus wanted the two men on the road to Emmaus to overcome their spiritual discouragement and go on to rejoice in the good news of a risen Christ who overcame death and brings eternal life. He achieved his goal since, after the Bible study, they admitted, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? By following these principles established by Christ, we will not only understand the biblical truths, but also let him light our hearts with the salvation that the scriptures themselves affirm he came to give us. Thank you, Lasang. It's good that we had a librarian to read that last one, correct? <laughs> Some of those were quite the tongue, tongue twisters. Um, I think, again, it, it, it draws to, to us, um, our mind, the importance of studying the Bible so that we are, have an understanding that we, so when we are communicating with others, that we can give them a reason for our faith. Witness means that I have something to tell. There's something that God did for me that I need to tell you. That is irrefutable witness. God is good. If you would open your uh, hymnals to hymn number 512, instead of taking the time to sing it, I want you to look at the words. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer. Verse 2, just when I need him, Jesus is true, never forsaking all the way through, giving for burdens pleasures anew. Verse 3, just when I need him, Jesus is strong, bearing my burdens all the day long, for all of my sorrow, giving a song. And verse 4, just when I need him, he is my all, answering when upon him I call, tenderly watching lest I should fall, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need him most. That is always true 24-7, 365 days a year. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have continually through the ages reached out to us, sinful human beings that strive to do things our own way, to uh, prove ourselves worthy of other men's praise. Forgive us. May we look to you because you have promised to be everything we need and you have also promised and demonstrated that if we will rely upon you, you are everything we need at all times. May we be attentive to your word, speak to us, help us to understand and to listen and to act. Bless us as we go our way this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.